This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. I often advise students that they find the intersection of passion, ability, and the market. What is it that you like to do, that you're good at, that the market will reward? Today's guest is a wonderful example of this. Dustin Lind is director of hitting and the assistant hitting coach for the San Francisco Giants. Pushing yourself and then finding ways to, to solve other people's problems. If you find ways to solve other people's problems, you'll always have a job, no matter what you want to work in. His ability to fuse his interests in biomechanics, baseball, and coaching created opportunities for him in professional baseball that didn't previously exist. He created unique value. Major League Baseball teams saw that value and established new roles in their organizations to connect Dustin with players. We're fortunate to get some time with Dustin in the offseason during a visit to his home state of Montana. Dustin, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us where you grew up and what did your parents do? So I grew up just down the road from Missoula here in uh, in Florence, mm-hmm. you know, 20 minutes south on Highway 93 yep. there. My, my dad's a, a math teacher at Hellgate High School and my mom does tax prep. So pretty normal growing up for, for a Western Montana kid, I'd, I'd say. Very good. And so tell us about, you know, your experience in high school and how you decided on undergrad and, and, and so forth. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I loved sports. I mean, mm-hmm. from, from a young age, I was always kind of a sports nut and I was always into statistics and, you know, seeing who the good players were. And then as I progressed through high school, just really loved baseball, basketball, football. Those were kind of the three sports that I played. And, and then as I got to the end of my high school time, I just started thinking, okay, well, well, what sports do I want to play in college? And, you know, I, I probably had the opportunity to do, you know, any of those three sports at, at a very low level. I mean, I, I was not by any means a good athlete, but really enjoyed baseball and, and decided that I, I wanted to go down that road and, mm-hmm. and really pursue college baseball. And so ended up uh, my freshman year at Montana State University Billings. And they, they had kind of just started their baseball program. I okay. think it was the third or fourth season that they had been back with, with baseball. And it was kind of this fledgling program that was just kind of starting to, to get rolling. And, and so I went there, and, and it ended up not being a great fit. So I transferred out and went to a junior college in, in the Sacramento area, okay. um, Sierra College. Still trying to kind of pursue Still the trying to dream. do things. And, and the whole time I was in college, I was just on the trainer's table. And so I was always hurt. I had really bad shoulder injuries all the way through and, and just could not stay on the field. So I, I spent way more time in the training room than I actually did on the playing field. And that kind of inspired me to to get into rehab and to really pursue the physical therapy route, which is eventually what I ended up doing. And at that point in time, I was dating the the woman who's now my wife. She was running track and field at Idaho State University. Okay. So transferred up to Idaho State University. We ended up getting married a short time later and um, finished my bachelor's degree at Idaho State University. Sure. In exercise, exercise science. Exercise yep. science. Now, is there something about your experience on the training table that would did you just want to understand why your own body was breaking down, or was it like you were inspired by the people that were helping you? Like, talk I, I about think that. it was. Yeah, I think it was a combination of both. And so, yeah. I, you know, I, I was spending a lot of time rehabbing in town here with uh, with Chad and Rachel Kay, who okay. are now at Groundworks Physical Therapy, and. My time with Chad and Rachel was was both instructive in helping me understand how the body worked, which was very interesting to me. And it also kind of gave me a, a big part of my life back because I really identified as an athlete. I really identified as a baseball player. And I, I looked at the way that they were doing that, and I was like, man, I would love to do that for other people sure. and, and help other athletes get back on the field and, and really elevate their performance. And so they, they had a huge impact on me kind of choosing this career route and it was it was really it was really awesome to spend that much time with them as bad as it was being off the field it was it was good for my future development to be able to be around them and and have those good mentors and so yeah with with that I ended up coming back to the University of Montana mm-hmm. to do the physical therapy program here I think I started that in 2014 and 
I mean, just had a great time. Learned so much here. It was just fantastic. And so at what point during that time did you decide, were you committed to trying to stay in baseball and sort of be a part of the coaching apparatus in baseball? Or like, how, what was your path to being a practitioner? That, that was actually kind of interesting. So after my first semester of physical therapy school, I mean, you're taking so many classes. You've yeah. got, I mean, it, it feels like drinking from a fire hose. Mm-hmm. At the end of the semester, I finished up my, uh, finished up my, my finals and I started thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to read something that I want to read for the first time in like four months. And so I hopped on to um, Baseball Prospectus. It's a, it's a you know, website that I've been going to for years, yep. and it's kind of for the baseball nerd community. And uh, there was an article titled, J.D. Martinez Gets a, a Degree in Hitting. And it was written by a guy named Ryan Parker, who I had never heard of at that point in time. And I started reading through the article because, you know, J.D. Martinez, I had watched two years earlier when he was with Houston and he wasn't very good by the standards of Major League Baseball and now all of a sudden he's one of the best hitters in Major League Baseball and I was like oh this this looks interesting how does this happen exactly and so I start reading through and he's got all sorts of video clips and I had never seen the swing broken down this way and I was just really curious and and the way that he was explaining the way that he was moving really connected with me as a physical therapy student because sure. now I was learning how the body moves, how joints are put together. I understand I like, it, yeah. Exactly, so I'm looking and I'm like, man, this guy is, n- one, not moving like I moved because I would always fill my swing and I'd always break it down and I was taught kind of a certain way of hitting and this looked like the exact opposite. And I was hmm. like, well, maybe I've been wrong about this the whole time. And so I started looking and breaking it down a little bit more and just trying to consume information. And at the same time, we were told by the physical therapy program, get out in the community, volunteer as much as you can. And I was obviously very passionate about baseball. So I was uh, volunteering locally down in the Bitterroot with with just you know high school players. Uh-huh. And I was doing more rehab and strength conditioning volunteer stuff. And inevitably, you get asked to coach because, you know, you're one of the guys who used to play here. You played some college baseball. You probably have some good ideas. Sure. And so started coaching. And, and at that point, I realized that my coaching skill set was a little bit short. And I, I probably didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And that's kind of a sobering experience when you realize that you're wrong and you, yeah. you got to kind of flip the script and start learning again. Yeah, I would suppose having been in the game for so long yourself as a player at a high level and then you know being immersed in this you know academic discipline of physical therapy yeah have confronting that like whoa I got to up my game to connect with these high school kids must mm-hmm. have been yeah must have been kind of eye opening it, it was and and so I I just became ravenous and tried to consume as much information sure. as I could and started making some really good connections with different hitting coaches around the country. And they had really good information. And then they started asking me questions and they'd be like, well, wait a second. I think you have a skill set that I can utilize here. And so I would go in and I would do you know, movement screens on players and we would write off season strength and conditioning programs. And we would just kind of put our heads together and, and try and get as much performance as we could out of these players. Yeah. So break that down just a little bit in the sense of you're probably trying to create a swing that's effective for hitting the ball and, and propelling it the way mm-hmm. you need to propel it. But you also don't want the athlete to hurt him or herself, so, you know, just the repetitive nature and that the number of swings you have to take to be an effective hitter has got to be tremendous. Yeah. My goals, first and foremost, are, are to keep athletes on the field as much mm-hmm. as possible and then to improve performance as much as possible. And luckily for us, a lot of the methods that we use to train those two ideas, they, they kind of go hand in hand. And so by, by adding strength and adding power to the athlete, we're going to make them safer. They're going to be able to decrease the, the load that's put through certain joints more effectively. And we're going to be able to get more performance out of it. And then we can really take a, a very technical look at how they're moving, the technique of the movement, so to speak, yeah. and try and optimize that for what we see in today's game. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's kind of taking all those puzzle pieces and putting them together and then just doing it in an evidence-based manner. Sure. When you say evidence-based, like, are, are you kind of part of this research apparatus? Are you collecting data on things you're doing? Like, how, how are, what's the interface of your work in, in, in the data process? We're always collecting and analyzing data on our hitters. I mean, we, and we've had that capability since about 
2015. I would say that 2015 is kind of an inflection point in baseball history, so to speak. We start seeing certain traits and characteristics within the game itself start to change very rapidly. And, okay. it's, and it's with the advent of a lot of this ball tracking technology that came out. So TrackMan is kind of the yeah, primary. Tell, tell us about what that is. Yeah, so TrackMan is it's kind of a space age technology. So it's used to track space shuttles. That was the original application of it. And they were looking at how space shuttles were rotating and vibrating and just moving as they went into space. And they adapted this to first golf, so, you know, you go down to the golf driving range, you've got your little trackman set up, and it tells you how hard you're hitting the ball, what the exit angle or the launch angle is, what the spin is, and they adapted that for baseball. Okay. And when that happens for baseball, now we start looking at pitchers, and we're like, okay, I'm not sure why this pitcher is so effective, but let's take a look. And this is kind of where the, the spin rate revolution starts, because now we're able to be very accurate with how we quantify velocity, movement, spin on particular pitches, but also batted balls. So as we hit the ball, what's happening? How far is it going? How fast is it coming off the bat? What angle is it leaving the bat at? And then how is it spinning coming off the bat? So spin rate is a new term for me. So it's the rate at which the ball is spinning. So that you know they track the speed of pitches all the time, yeah. and the speed off the bat too, but but how quickly the ball is spinning. Talk, talk through that. You're, you're looking at the, the rate at which it spins, obviously. Yeah. More spin has more potential for movement. But you're also looking at the axis on which it's spinning. You're also looking at what's called spin efficiency, how much of that spin is actually contributing to the movement of the pitch. Wow. And we're looking at all these things, obviously, from a pitching development standpoint. But now hitting coaches are tasked with trying to kind of neutralize these sure. because we have very smart pitching coaches out there that are using the data and the, and the technology to drive performance changes with pitchers, which I think is why you've seen pitchers become so dominant over recent years. It's not only that they're throwing harder, it's that they have nastier stuff. Mm -hmm. And we, we always hear about how strikeouts are continually going up. And a lot of people like to point the finger at the hitters and say, well, they're just trying to hit home runs. They're just selling out for home runs. They don't care about strikeouts. I haven't met a single major league hitter that likes striking out, and I haven't met a single <laughs> major well league. Put. Yeah, I haven't met a single major league hitting coach that doesn't care about his team striking out. I, it, that's that's just not a, a good narrative, in my opinion. I think the thing that is driving most of this is just how nasty pitchers are. I mean, they're better now than they ever have been at any point in baseball history, in my opinion. So we skipped a couple pieces there to get into just the just geek out on baseball for of a course. second, which I appreciate. Talk about your pathway into Major League Baseball. It's kind of an interesting story how I got in in, in the first place. I, I was actually working as a physical therapist down in the Bitterroot Valley, down in Stevensville. So okay. I, I was just doing the, you know, the regular rehab stuff. Come in, you've got back pain. I'll I'll help you with that. Oh, you had shoulder surgery. I'll rehab you with that. Mm -hmm. Knee surgery. I'll do the same thing. And I'm doing this, and all of a sudden I get a message on my phone one of these days after I've finished seeing all my patients and. It's, uh, it's a guy named Andy McKay, who's currently the, the farm director. He runs the, the minor leagues for the Seattle Mariners. Okay. And so he reaches out and he says, hey, I've, I've heard your name coming up a lot, and I'm just curious to get to know you a little bit. So mm -hmm. I called him up and, and I said, well, I'm, you know, my name's Dustin Lynn, blah, 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 and I'm in Montana, and I'm a strength coach, I'm a physical therapist, and I do some hitting stuff on the side. So I've kind of got this weird skill set and... You know, I, I, at that point in time, I was seeing players in the off season, so mostly remotely. So a player would fly me out to their home city, and I would work with them on their swing, or work with them on rehab okay. stuff, or work with them on. It was mostly strength and conditioning. That's mostly what I was doing at that point in time. But it was kind of you know combining all these different uh, disciplines, so to speak. And he said, "Well, that's a really interesting." skill set. Um, I want you to talk to our front office group. So I started talking to people and interviewing, and the interview process took a, a number of months. I mean, there wasn't any rush on their end to, sure. to bring me on board. And, you know, I was very happy doing what I was doing. But we got to a point before spring training where they said, all right, we'd like to offer you a job. Hmm. And it's going to be, you know, probably 50% rehab, you know, 25% strength and conditioning, probably 25% hitting. I said, that sounds really fascinating. And so they were like, you know, we're not sure how this is going to work. We're yeah. not sure this is what your job's going to look like in a year, but let's get you in. Let's get you acclimated to professional baseball and just see how it goes. And, and I came in 
and there was an immediate need on the hitting side because there was this influx of hitting technologies. So we're we're tracking, you know, limb movement like while guys are swinging. We're mm-hmm. tracking, you know, the the ball launch monitors. We're tracking what the bat's doing in space, and it was all pretty new technology at that point in time. And they just kind of dumped it in my lap, and they said, "Figure this out yeah. and tell us what it means, and then." find a way to integrate it into our process on a day-to-day basis. And so I spent my whole first year just studying all the technology and stuff like that. And at that point, um, they, they came to me and they, they said, hey, we'd like you to kind of oversee our, our minor league hitting development, but we also want you to be involved with scouting and player acquisition. We also want you to be involved with our high performance team. And so I was getting exposure to all these different avenues in baseball that I had never yeah. even thought about. Like I had never sat with a scout at a game and like talked to him about players and what do you see? Like why why are you interested in this guy? So that was 2019. I was involved in, in all of that stuff. And then obviously in late 2019, early 2020, Seattle, uh, San Francisco comes calling and I get hired by the Giants to retain my, my role as director of hitting, but also be on the major league coaching staff full time. Yeah. I mean, just talk about that. Like just kind of being into that world that you sort of dreamed of as a kid. It was a really cool moment. And I had spent some time in 2019 with the major league team there in Seattle. So mm-hmm. I had had some exposure to major league players and just been able to see how they train, been able to see how they perform out on the field and, and do all those things. But to be able to do it full time in San Francisco, especially with the roster that we had with, yeah. you know, Hall of Fame caliber players who have won multiple World Series rings, like the guys who have been there and done that. That was a really cool opportunity to be able to go in. And and those guys, I mean, to their credit, were very open to new ideas. Yeah. And that's not always the case. I mean, I I could walk into, you know, maybe even 29 other clubhouses in Major League Baseball and not get the response that that we got when we went into San Francisco there. Guys were ready to, to push themselves a little bit and try and get more performance. We'll be back to my conversation with Dustin Lind after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Hey, this is Ryan Tutel and Coulter Nuanas from ESPN Missoula, and you're listening to A, a New, New Angle. Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Dustin Lind, hitting and strength coach for the San Francisco Giants. And talk about trying to sort of bring that process to bear with this group of of tremendously talented, deeply experienced players. Like, how, talk about that moment where you're trying to make a connection with these folks. Yeah, I I think it's really interesting because I didn't play in Major League Baseball. Yeah, a lot of people ask us how how did you get these guys to listen to you, and and I think it came down to preparation. We we were really prepared. We did a lot of research on these players. We looked at their best stretches. All right, what are they doing from a movement standpoint? What are they likely doing from an approach standpoint at the mm-hmm. plate? Like what's their game plan potentially? And then we prepare all that information. We try and find the best things about what they were doing and kind of mash them together. And then we we approach the players and we and we obviously get to know them as people first. And then the the questions inevitably going to come. Hey, what do you got? Hey, what do you think about this? And when you're prepared with really well-reasoned logic, yeah. players are typically very open and eager to, to get better. Because I, players don't like playing poorly. They like playing good. And and they, they view coaches as an avenue to give them the information that they need to play well. And we, we try and empower players to be their own best coaches, so to speak. So we give them the information and we put them in an environment to – find solutions to the problems that they're going to see in that night's game. But it's on them to kind of make the adjustments and figure it out on their own. And and that's what a lot of these guys have been so good about doing. They've come in and they've just kind of made the adjustment here, made the adjustment there, and, and that's gotten them to this point. So they're very adept at making adjustments. And so if you come in and you suggest something, you know, whether it be a, a minor tweak to the swing or, or maybe a, a minor tweak to the approach, a lot of times these major league players will take it into the game that night. And you'll see performance gains that night. It's, yeah. That was the most shocking thing to me when I started working with this population because you, you come in and you think, all right, well, if we're going to make a swing change, it's it's going to take some time. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. It, there's going to be some growing pains. It's not always the case. Yeah, change it. I mean, they're such good athletes. They're yeah. so skilled. Yeah. 
So you mentioned a, a bit ago this this kind of you know the dimensions in the game with pitchers becoming so skilled and pitching kind of dominating the game. As the as you observe the game and its trajectory, I mean, one the level of performance across the board is going up. The training methods are getting more sophisticated, more effective, more data driven. The nutrition, like all the as- aspects that these players. And baseball's, you know, hopefully shed some of its some of its past of, of you know, steroids and all of that. Definitely. Like, but people are getting smarter. They're they're approaching it with a different level of professionalism and a more mm-hmm. sophisticated methodology. Where do you think the game is going? And I ask that in the sense of like, is there a point at which the stresses on the body kind of outpace what the body can do? Like, how, how do you sort of view that? I. I think we're seeing that on the pitching yeah. side now. Yeah. I mean, there are so many pitchers that spend a large amount of time on the injured list every single year. The pendulum always seems to swing back. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, back when, you know, we'll, we'll call it the 80s and 90s, you had a bunch of guys who just ate up a bunch of innings. They pitched a ton. Yeah, I mean, even before that, guys were pitching hundreds of innings in, yeah. in a season. And now his stuff has slowly, slowly creeped up. And then 2015, just this explosion where we have these elite power arms coming in. The the more stress you put on the body, obviously, the more likely you are to, to get injured. And we're finding that a lot of these pitchers, they're getting injured at younger and younger ages. And so a, a lot of that is we have younger players that are developing more quickly we're microwaving them rather than slow cooking yeah, them so like to speak analogy. yeah well and put. so and then you've got sport specialization where kids are specializing in pitching younger and younger and younger and younger yep. and so you you're seeing one sport athletes at you know age 12 now instead of you know age 18 you know a lot of that stress is just accumulating mm-hmm. and it's causing injury a little bit earlier and so you're starting to see this I'm not sure what is going to happen because teams are able to just acquire so many power arms and just cycle through them. Yeah. All right. The supply you know, is, exactly. is exceeds the demand. Yep. Exactly. You've got so many of these guys. And so when somebody goes down, guess what? You're getting another guy coming up who throws 98 with a nasty slider. Like mm-hmm. that's all you're seeing nowadays. Hitting is a little bit different just because you're you're not leveraging the the more delicate tissues in the body. I mean, the shoulder is just not built for overhand throwing. No. Neither is the elbow. And when we throw that hard, we're putting an insane amount of stress on those joints. And so you're you're going to have some injuries in that case. Hitting it's distributed a little bit more evenly, so to speak. But you're also starting to see a lot of um, soft tissue injuries, hamstring strains. Guys are losing time due to oblique strains. That's been something that's hmm. really been on the rise. Yep. We're creating bigger and bigger engines. That was actually an issue for us this year. We had a lot of guys with oblique strains. It's got to be tough. Like to make it to the major league has to just demand so much of an individual and a family, really. Yet at the same time, like most folks aren't going to get to that level. Most mm-hmm. folks want to have. Well, everybody wants to have a healthy life and, and so forth. Like, How would you advise a young person listening to this about how to balance diversity of athletic movement um, and abilities with wanting to specialize in a discipline and achieve whatever level they can? Yeah, that, I, I think that's a really good question. Obviously, like these are just my opinions, sure. but all the, all the scientific literature that I have consumed on the, on the subject, and I, I feel like it's quite a bit, points to athletes really more generalizing their their athletic experience early on so Mm -hmm. sampling lots of different sports lots of different variety of movements so if you're going to be a a baseball pitcher you know maybe do something besides swimming go you know play soccer or 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 something like that or, or football and just really being generalized and then picking things that you really enjoy doing and then really going after those. And when you look at how humans acquire skill and and just the the general scientific literature that's out there on skill acquisition, the 10,000 hour rule has been made very popular. And, and what they're finding is it's the quality of the practice and, and kind of the differentiation of, of different movement techniques. So body control, as we like to think about okay. it, that really lends itself to improved athletic performance because you can practice 20,000 hours and still be a lousy player and you can you know play maybe 3,000 hours and and play at a national level depending on your sport and Mm -hmm. so I, I think there's a lot to be said about just general athletic development early 
paring it down to, you know, a couple sports that you really like and just spend a lot of time playing those. And then, you know, once once you get to a point where, you know, you're a sophomore or junior in high school and you're not necessarily getting the the offers that you want, okay, now maybe it's time to maybe specialize a little bit more and get a little more skilled in the sport that you want to play in college. Yeah. That's what sports are all about. It's all about creating a healthy lifestyle and, and enjoying your time with those social groups that you build in those teams. Because I, I believe personally that, that sports – really teaches us a lot about how to interact with others, how to work with teams, how to handle conflict. I mean, all things that in today's day and age we really need help more with. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. so as we close, Dustin, just give us, you know, kind of advice that you might have for a 25-year-old version of yourself. I mean, you've done a tremendous job of figuring out how to sort of pair your skills and experiences with opportunity in front of you. How would you advise younger folks for – achieving some of the same success. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to really pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And I mean, that's something that I, I did constantly, obviously as an athlete when I was training, but then, you know, in academia, I would really try and push myself because, you know, school's not always easy and it's no. hard to sit down and pay attention and focus and go and do all the extra work that you need to do. So pushing yourself and then finding ways to, to solve other people's problems. If you find ways to solve other people's problems, you'll always have a job, no matter what you want to work in. And and that's really kind of the the route that I took into baseball was finding, you know, areas that, that organizations wanted their problems solved and just finding applications to be able to do that. And and so I think that's those are probably the two biggest things, you know, just continually pushing yourself, trying to be better than you than you have been, and then just trying to tackle new problems and, and help other people solve theirs. So So I got one bonus question for you, Dustin, that I've always wondered about. Why is it that in baseball the managers and the other coaches wear the uniform? I, I've never understood that either. It's kind of I mean, funny to see the, the old guys running out to the mound. and the Yeah, yeah. It, it is really interesting. I actually think in baseball history, and this is not by any means you know factual, this is just what I think. Back in the day, it was very common to have a player manager. Yep. So someone who yep. was playing, but also writing the lineup and coaching sure. the team, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that that tradition has just kind of carried on. And now the manager and all the coaches wear uniforms. Yeah. And baseball uh, likes to hold on to traditions. So oh my gosh. Yeah. There go. <laughs> Every tradition, it will it will keep it in, until the, the cows come home. That's for sure. Awesome. I wanted that answered. Thanks. Yeah. Well done. Dustin Lind, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer, BTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.